Amen. Amen. This is the third uh, in a six-part series on Romans 1 through 8. As you notice, that given that there's only six uh, lectures and eight chapters, we kind of do like more than one chapter uh, each time. It's pretty cramped. It's pretty fast. We're moving pretty fast today. We're going to get to the end of chapter 4 today. Okay. So uh, a bit of a review um, when we start uh, what, what we're trying to do in our time together. Um, there's a lot of different way, ways to read the Bible. A lot of different assumptions people bring when they read the Bible. Here, the goal in this in our time together, the goal is historical. We the the, the, the first question we're always asking is what would the first century Christians in Rome how would they have understood the letter? That's kind of the number one question. Is that it's how we evaluate everything. Okay, um, so. Um, and the assumption is that, why is that useful? The assumption is that whatever we want to get out of it today, whatever understanding we want to interpret, whatever ways we want to change our life or our theology based on that, um, is going to be founded on this historical reading. So the historical reading um, provides the starting point of what it meant, tells us what it means, is what my, my New Testament professor drilled into our heads, and, and, and put it the backwards negative way, the text cannot mean what it ever meant. Okay, so the, there's a, there's a historical meaning and there's a present application. Those two are, are integrally related. Okay. So we start from the, the historical. Okay. <clears throat> uh, some reviews from the, our first week together. Um, the church at Rome. Um, Christians in the first century, their Bible is the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. They're extremely familiar with it. Why? Because they don't have the New Testament. When they get together to read the Bible, they're reading the Old Testament. And since the most of our Greek speakers are reading the Septuagint, Okay. We read the New Testament, they don't. They don't have it. Um, so one of the, one of the questions they're ha constantly dealing with is, how does the church, how does Jesus, the entire Jesus movement, connect to the Old Testament? That is their fundamental question. And indeed, I would argue, most if not all of the New Testament is written to answer that question. Okay. If you start thinking of those lines, the New Testament makes a lot more sense. Okay. The problem, of course, is we don't know the Old Testament, so we really have going, it's really answering questions that we don't have. So, so not understanding the Old Testament means mis misinterpreting the New Testament. Kind of a big problem. Okay. Uh, the church at Rome, uh, just a bit of um, a notice, we think that there's tension. In the fact that wrote, the letter to the Romans pretty much shows you that there's tension between the Jewish and Gentile Christians. Um, the, the, Paul has never been to Rome. He did not establish this church. This church was probably in existence by the early 40s, probably. Um, Rome is the capital, and by the time Jesus uh, resurrected, uh, you know, disciples spread out and probably arrived in Rome rather early and, and founded a church, most likely among the Jews who became Christians. Um, there were a few Gentiles hanging on. And then in 49 AD, uh, under the reign of Claudius, there was a um, rioting among the Jewish community over, as according to the Roman historian Suetonius, um, over the, the identity of the person named Crestus, which we think is just a misunderstanding of Christ. Sound, it sounds pretty similar. The Jews were fighting over Crestus. And uh, probably fighting over Jesus, who's, who he is. And uh, as a result, Claudius got so mad at the Jews, he expelled them all in 49 AD. And they didn't come back until 54 AD. During that five, six years, the, the church at Rome became completely Gentile. Okay, and probably grew as a Gentile Christ a church. So right around 54, the Jewish community came back, and now the church had to deal with a previously dominant group, the, the Jews, running the church, now coming back to a church that's run, run by Gentiles. And now there is tension between the group. How sh who, who is the church? How should we be? And that's a kind of a fundamental question. And then um, this letter, we think, is written around 55, right, right at the heart of that troubled in reintegration of the church. Um, also remem remember, uh, Paul is writing this letter because he is raising money. This is, a, this is a missionary support letter. Paul's never been to Rome. Paul wants to go to Spain. He wants to go through Rome, hang out with him for a while, have the Romans send him money and support and, and pledge support for his, his missionary work to Spain. Um, so this is an interesting letter in that Paul is trying to, first of all, deal with some of the problems, like rep his reputation with the Romans, you know, because people heard about him, so what, what, he needs to kind of give, if there's pro negative reputation, negative news, he, he needs to kind of deal with that. He also needs to kind of explain what he actually teaches, 
so the people in Rome understand his gospel. So it's kind of a, a longish uh, letter that, that really introduces himself to the Church of Rome. Okay. Any questions on that, on kind of the historical background? Um, we are. We had a couple things to remind ourselves. The word gospel is a not a generic word for good news, but refers to the proclamation or the accession of a new king, emperor, or god. So the word Greek word euangelion. Let me let me back that up. When I'm saying gospel, I mean the way Paul used the Greek word euangelion. I don't mean the word in English today. So the word in English, gospel today is used in many ways. Okay. Uh, for example, when somebody says that's the gospel of truth, what do they mean by that? It's really, really true, right? That's the gospel truth, okay? Or people say, okay, okay you know, that's the, um, the gospel according to Steve Jobs. You know, it's like, okay, so mm -hmm. proclamation of, you know, I suppose, uh, <laughs> proclamation of freedom from for all, I don't know. Um, but in Christian circles, gospel refers to some kind of um, individual, how individuals become saved by grace. Okay? Um, and that's all fine. That's how the English word works. What I want to get at is the Greek word, uh, in, in Romans refers to the proclamation of a new king or an emperor. And for the Jewish mindset, it refers to the proclamation of the reign of God. So if you think in terms of Old Testament terms, God, the world, God created the world, the world rebelled, God created Israel as, as a solution to the problem. Israel became a kingdom. It, the kingdom is destroyed. It rebels and is destroyed. And the prophets keep saying, one day God's going to restore Israel. One day it's coming. The kingdom is coming. Okay. In Jewish mindset, that would be the gospel, the proclamation that this kingdom has actually arrived. Okay. That's, that would be the, 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 the context from which they understand these words. And we get this idea in Romans 1, 1 through 7, right in the beginning. And we went through the idea that if you look at the gospel, then we have all these other power words, royalty words that deal with kingship, like Christ, which is a title, Messiah, kingship. Son of God is a king, kingship word, descended from David, of course. Um, we don't really have that in America, do we? Kingly lines. Doesn't quite work. But you know, I mean, so Aragorn is from the you know, son of Arathorn. There we go. That, that helps. You can always just pull fiction. You know, he's, 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 a, he's a direct line of, wait, what's his name? Shoot. Isildur, right? He's, a, he's, a, he's the heir of Isildur. So just think, think, think descended from David, think Isildur, because you get, you get the idea of bloodline and kingly line. Um, and he is designate the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, right? So Aragorn is crowned because he defeated a Sauron. So you have this demonstration of power, um, Christ our Lord, and that he's calling for obedience to all the world. So you see this right at the beginning of Romans, this, this explanation of the gospel. The gospel is defined right here. It's a proclamation of this new world king, world, world dominion king of the final age who, is, who has done this amazing thing to, to deserve being called a king, and then is calling for obedience for all the world. Everybody should obey this king. Okay, any questions on that, on gospel? This is a review. So, um, we didn't have to uh, deal with the problem, the phrase, the righteousness of God, and we said the phrase does not mean imputed righteousness, but it refers to God's commitment and faithfulness to bring justice and peace to his creation, bringing the world to its rightful state as he intended. It can also refer to whatever action that God takes to restore his creation. So the word righteousness of God refers to a God's characteristic. God, our God is not the kind of God who encounters a problem and gives up. He's the kind of God who, who is committed and will pull all the way through. Okay. So we're just talking about, you know, if you have Steve, no, no, sorry, not Chris was talking about growing cells in the lab. Okay. Now growing cells in the lab, let's say it didn't work. What do you do? You just trash the whole thing and throw it away and start over, right? Basically. Again. That's not God. <laughs> God says, I'm going to fix this and make it work. I'm going to make this, ex this thing work. Okay? So there's a righteousness of God. Uh, it's just contaminated. There's no way to get the contamination out. That's a great point. So what does God do? You're welcome. Um, he, 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 in, he enters into the cells. <laughs> and tries to decontaminate. I think, I think the analogy starts to break down at that point. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm just, I'm just, that's a great point, but decontamination is sin. Okay, that's actually, I like that. I like that. I like that analogy. I know you think it breaks down. I need to talk. To, I need to talk to you more about details about that one. That's a good one. Okay, um, so let's 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 not walk through these. We, we don't have a lot of time today. So let's um let's look at the next section, which is um the God's wrath, and we talked about God. There's a proclamation that righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. God's faithfulness to the world. Um, when he, when Paul talks about that, he's really talking about the Old Testament story, which is. 
the world was created well, it rebelled and is broken, how is God going to fix it? Is he faithful enough to fix it? And if he is faithful enough to fix it, how is he going to do that? So Paul moves to the problem in the world. And if you look at the problem, there is really a rebelling against God by re refusing to acknowledge God as God. And so we talk about how God's wrath uh, is, uh, is uh, revealed toward those who do not honor or acknowledge God as God. And their punishment, strangely enough, is that they live sinful lives. Right? You guys talk, we, we talked about this as being a very strange way of punishing people. But the, the, your punishment for being a liar is that you are a liar. And if you steal something, your punishment is that you're a thief. And if you're an adulterer, your punishment is that you are an adulterer. That it is the corruption of hum, human as the image of God that is the punishment for failing to acknowledge God as God. A very strange idea. We tend to think of punishment as something outside. And it is. At the end of the day, last day, there's a judgment of the last day. But in this present day, we want to see greedy people get their comeuppance and get totally trashed. And many of them don't. And we think, that's not fair. And God says, I, I already punished them. They live as greedy people. They live as scummy, greedy people. So it's a very interesting a view, a viewpoint on, 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 on judgment and sin in the present day. Okay. Which then takes us immediately back. When Paul talks like this, it has an under, underlying assumption of Jewish anthropology, which is a very high, exalted view of humanity. Okay, that's very critical. The Bible views humans, if you look at Genesis 1, if you look at Psalm 8, we're a little below God in terms of our intended glory and honor and dignity. Okay? People who are quite intended like this aren't supposed to live, live greedy, fearful, anxious lives. And okay? they're not supposed to live that way. The fact that we do is a, is a result of our failure to acknowledge God as God. So that we are now living this life of quiet desperation or lives of rats, or what do you want to call it? Okay? Versus, versus the high calling that we're given. Okay. Paul was talking to people who don't acknowledge God as God, which from everybody in, in the pre-reading letter would say, oh, those are the Gentiles. Because Jews acknowledge God as God. Gentiles worship idols. They don't understand who God is. We have a whole group of people who says, we know who God is. Okay. And, and Paul turns around and looks at them and says, you know, you guys feel superior because you are God's people. You have God's Torah. You have the covenant with Abraham. You have Moses and, the, and everything. But your problem is your lives aren't any better. Look at the Jewish community. Look at the pagan community. Same kind of adultery. Same kind of salt stealing and thievery and lying and murder and hatred. Same kind of strife. There's no difference. Right? So Paul's point is you are to, when God eventually judges people, he's going to judge individually according to how you live. You don't live any better lives. The Torah has not done anything for you. Being the people of God hasn't accomplished the thing. Okay, so that's he's going to put the Jews in the same place of judgment as as, as Gentiles. Um, if justification then is the de declaration of victory in a trial, and the idea is that at, at the end God's going to vindicate His people, these are the people who are right about God. Okay. And there's a whole group of people who are wrong about God. These are the people who are right about God, and they're going to be vindicated. They're going to be people of God. And, and, and Paul's point is, Jews cannot say, oh, I'm part of that people just because I got circumcised, and I don't eat a certain kind of food, and I don't work on Saturday. That's not good enough. Okay, you can't just say, I'm Jewish, and be part of this covenant people of God. Okay. Having the Torah cannot justify. It cannot make you part of this group. Um, you, it only can only make sin known to you. And that's actually one line, which that line will get expanded on later on. And then, Jews find themselves in the unexpected position of standing alongside Gentiles, as both are indicted under God's legal jurisdiction for being under the power of sin. And that's where we ended up last time we met. Okay. Any questions? It's kind of a brief overview of where we are so far. The question was, okay. Um, yeah, seven verses. <laughs> oh, that's just six verses for the. the these are these are the most some of the most dense packed six verses you're gonna run into. Okay, so we're gonna spend a little time on this. I'm sorry, half of our time would be spent on this, and then 
we'll take a break and then we'll take and we'll do chapter end of chapter three and chapter four rather more quickly. But these verses are are huge. Um, let me um, re remind us of where we were last week. This is the ending to last week, and he says, "What shall we conclude? Conclusion is critical, right?" Are we any better, not we being Jews? Are Jews any better, not at all? We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. Okay, so this is what he's putting it. And, I, and the highlighted words are charge, held accountable, and declare righteous. And these are all forensic words. These are all courtroom words. Charge is in really a Greek technical term for indictment. Held accountable means to be under the jurisdiction of. And declare righteous means declare victorious. So no one will be declared part of the vindicated group by observing the Torah. Just can't do it. Okay. Or actually, by, it's actually not observing, but by works of the Torah, which is a technical term referring to Jewish boundary markers. Um, Sabbath, circumcision, food laws. Okay. The things that distinguish a Jew from everybody else. That is not gonna get you in. Doing those things, being Jewish, being really, really Jewish, is not gonna, not gonna vindicate you. Okay. <clears throat> So that's kind of where we left off, okay? Everybody's under the charge, and now we come to this, these critical verses in the, in the, in the letter of Romans. Yes, question? Uh, should you use the, the courtroom metaphor so that, that how the courtroom works back then? Right, right. Uh, so yeah, that, I didn't get a chance to review that, did I? Uh, we'll see it again. We'll, okay. we'll, we'll get to that again. It'll, it'll, it'll pop up. So maybe we'll, we'll do it then. Okay, so a quick reminder of what that means. <laughs> um, 21 to 26. But now the righteousness of God, the phrase comes back, has been manifested apart from the Torah. I'm going to just read Torah here. Although the Torah and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an expiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies him who has faith in Jesus. Okay. This is a dense, dense passage. This, I just want to say, these few words here have been the subject of so much theological discussion, arguments over the centuries. You can, the people who read books and books have been written about these verses. So I just want to, by just as a way of saying, I'm not going to cover all of that. Okay, I'm not going to give you every perspective. Just not going to do it. So okay. what I'm going to do is we're going to continue the thought that we've developed so far in chapters one, uh, all, verse one, all the way to verse twenty, and we're going to go with it. And if you have questions, like, oh, I heard somebody say that before in a different way, absolutely. <laughs> I'd be surprised if you haven't heard it in some other way or heard it in five, six, six different other ways. Okay, that's just kind of reality. Um, and if you want to raise questions about that, you can. Okay. So first of all, gosh, the phrase comes back. Uh, first of all, but now, okay, but now is eschatological phrasing. In the Old Testament prophet, there's always the, in the former days and the latter days, in those days, okay, the phrasing is, we have right now we have a situation, and then there is a new age that is to come, which God will change everything, okay. Here, Paul says, but now, we're here. The new age has come. This is the mark of the new age. This is kind of this is what we call, call, it, call it eschatological language. God is doing something new, something final, something decisive. And God's righteousness of God has been manifested. Okay? God's righteousness, God's commitment to making his renew, renewing his creation, that is now manifested. It is manifested apart from the Torah. Okay? It's something different from the Torah. So it's, but, notice, nearly Paul just adds the next phrase, Torah and the prophets bear witness to it. And right now, right, right there, we're capturing the tension between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Right? Because Paul's made it very clear, the Jews had the Torah, it didn't do them any good. It did not transform them, it did not make them better people. Okay? So what is this new righteousness of God? New God's new faithfulness, who knew the world? Well, it's shown up, obviously then, it's not part of the Torah but it is integrally connected to it. Right? So the tension between the two is captured right in this phrase, and Paul's very careful about that. He, he includes both phrases to make sure you don't, you, know, you, don't, you don't lose the fact that we're still dealing with the Law and the Prophets. 
And remember from last time, a lot of the prophets refers to the Old Testament. Torah, the, the two, set, two major sections, the Torah and the Nabi'im. Okay. Apart from the Torah, Torah prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God um, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Um, first of all, this is good news for Jews because the Torah condemned them. Our previous section, remember this whole list of Old Testament passages that says, you guys are all sinful, you guys are all sinful, nobody seeks God. So everyone who believes is now, is, is now um, it, 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 it has received, received the righteousness of, no, sorry, not, not, um, they bear with the righteousness of God through faith and Christ for all who believe. So all who believe is part of this, this new community. Okay, so Jews are definitely part of this. The Gentiles as well. So that's a good thing. Um, second, it is is through f the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, Christ, Messianic King. It is through the Jewish Messiah. Now think about it. He could have said, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the Torah. Um, the righteousness of God through faith in Caesar or some other person. But instead, we're heading back to, first of all, the connection to the Torah, and second, is connected to the Jewish Messiah. Okay. We are still sticking with the Jewish story, even though the Jewish story has gone horribly wrong. Okay. So we're, we're, we're continuing that. Okay. Sure, this is a good time. Yeah. Is it, so I know there's the issue of Translation? faith and the belief. Yeah, we're going to get there. Okay, okay, yeah, it's coming up. But let me, um, first of all, uh, recognize that this is a significant beginning of a significant section in the book of Romans. Um, you guys remember Romans 1 through um, 16, Romans 1, 1 through 16, Paul was really, really serious about convincing the Romans that he really wanted to go to Rome. Remember that whole, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel um, right here. So we have this 16 through 17 is kind of the, the introductory to the whole top, major topic of the letter of Romans. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. To the Jews first, also to the Greek, for in, the, in it the righteousness of God is revealed, and we said, like, through faith, for faith, or ex pisteos, ace piston, out of faith, into faith. Right? And we're, we're thinking, what does that mean? What, it's kind of a topic sentence. He's going to explain it further. And then we have, right here, chapter 321, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. Right? So over there we have the righteousness of God is revealed, so here we have the section, that's the intro subject, here is the, the topic being re, reintroduced again, this time explained, expounded further. And the section in between then is really the need, in which we saw already. The, the, why do we need the righteousness of God? Why does God need to be faithful to the world to fix it? Because the world is messed up. Start, you have the Gentiles who are, who are idolaters, and you have Jews with the Torah who can't do anything, who, who doesn't do anything for them. Okay, put them all together, we need a new manifestation of God's command to make things work. So this, you can see this um, as, as, a, as, as a kind of clear section markers for, for, the, for the beginning part of the Romans. Okay. And second, you can see that the righteousness of God in these two, in the intro section and in this section, are both inwardly tied to faith. Okay. Over there, we have a rather, I think, mysterious, almost you know, enigmatic, ace, ec, you know, ec piste, it was ace piston, out of faith into faith. What does that mean? And back then, I believe I said, I think it refers to out of the faithfulness of God, for the purpose of creating the faithfulness among his people. But that's not in the text. That's my interpretation. And how did I get that? Because I argue that that's, that's what's coming up in the Romans. So here, we're going to get uh, some of that coming out. And it's the righteousness of God. And we're going to look at this phrase in a bit. Okay, because right here, you, once again, you have faith, and this is a, um, sorry, believe is, in Greek, is the same verb, pisteo, is to, 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 to faith, it's a verb, how's that? <laughs> Just, I, I want to use these exactly the same way, okay? It's because these, these two words in Greek are almost, almost identical to each other. So they're the same root. In, in English, we don't have that. So through faith for all who, okay. Uh, so we, we do it that way. And also we need to mech around with the Greek a little bit here because the translation here is somewhat problematic. Okay, there, is a, there is a debate over the translation on this one. Um, so let's look at the Greek. The first question we're gonna, have, we're gonna run into is, well the major question we run into is, do, do you wanna translate faith in Jesus or faithfulness of Jesus? The Greek is dia, dia means through or via, um, episteos Jesu Christu. 
Okay. So that's it. That's just four words. Dia is the preposition. Pisteos means faith. Yesu Christu. Um, Yesu Christu, our genitive of following the pisteos. So faith, Jesus Christ. Usually genitive, you translate of. So faith of Jesus Christ. Um, and that's exactly what King James does. The, by faith of Jesus Christ. Which does nothing for you. We don't know what that means. Is it faith in Jesus or the faith of Jesus? Or faithfulness of Jesus Christ? Okay. So if you notice, NIV, ASV, a whole bunch of them go with through faith in Jesus Christ. The emphasis is with the, it's manifested through presumably our faith in Jesus. Right? Which is possible, but if you notice NIV 2011, um, so I would say this is heavily influenced by the Reformation. NIV 2011, they turn it around and say, you know what? The footnote says, which uh, footnotes usually work out, is you have a committee and you have the minority group says, we like this one better. And so I stick in the footnote. Uh, it says, through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Now, I, you know, I know the option one provides no interpretation. It brings the ambiguity into English. It doesn't help us do too much. Option two fits the Reformed tradition that we are justified by our faith in Jesus Christ. <coughs> now, option three is the most grammatically likely for two reasons. One, um, option two creates redundancy. The option three does not. And let me show you in a bit. But first of all, gr grammatically speaking, <coughs> in the book of Romans, if a genitive follows pisteos, faith of something, it's always a subjective genitive. What I mean by that is it's always, the genitive word is always a subject. That is, Jesus Christ is the subject of faith. His faith. Okay. So, so every all the other usage <coughs> in the book of Romans follows a particular pattern. Pattern. Faith of God is God's faithfulness, not faith in God. Okay. That's always been the case in, in, in the book of Romans. So quite consistent. In terms of the redundancy, if you look at the phrase, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe in Jesus Christ. Right? Duh. <laughs> It's like, wait a minute, what? Why, 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 why are we saying this twice? Right? It is much rather, I think the better reading is, through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. The righteous God is revealed through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. What he's done for all who believe. Okay? It just, it's, a, it's a better reading. It, it, it emphasizes what Jesus does. Otherwise, what it emphasizes is what we do. Right? How is the righteous of God revealed? It's revealed through our faith in Jesus. That's how, 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 the traditional, how, the, how the traditional reading is focused on our faith. Whereas I think we're we want to turn around and say, it's really about what Jesus did on the cross. His faithfulness. That makes the difference. Is there any other explanation for, for all who believe in... Well, we presume it's implied. right? It's quite, it's, it's quite clear that people believe in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> right? so, but we'll get to that. Because the idea of faith will come, will come back. But, but the text is going to stop there. Um, so I'm wondering if, I mean, that does remove, sort of removes that redundancy mm -hmm. if, if it were for all who believe in Jesus Christ, then the redundancy would very obviously be there. Right. But the fact that it's removed could actually make the case that... Um, Through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe implicitly in Jesus Christ. Right. Unless you're saying we're believing something else, then it's not redundant. Right. But then what are you believing in? Yeah, yeah that's the question. So I, I, I think um, the righteous God has been manifested through not our faith. I think that's too powerful. Right? But, you, but you'll notice this reading is based on the, reform, the Reformation reading of righteousness of God, which we talked about the first week. Remember, when we said the Lutheran understanding of righteousness of God is that righteousness of God refers to God's giving us a status of righteousness. So this is more, it's, it's, it's given to, so if you want to put it this way, but now a status of righteousness that comes from God has been manifested from, from for the law and it, is, it is, and it comes manifested through our belief in Jesus Christ. You see how that reading works? Okay, so that would be the traditional Lutheran reform reading, reform, uh, Reformation reading. Okay. Which had created some redundancy. Whereas we, I think, shown pretty clearly that in the Old Testament, the phrase righteousness of God never means that. It refers to God's character. 
So if God's characteristic, God's faithfulness to us is revealed, then it should be revealed through Jesus' faithfulness, not through our faith. Right? It makes no sense. So you notice how these the interpretation of these phrases impact everything else. It just kind of flows out of that. Okay. So the, the fact that Jesus was faithful, I think that's pretty clear. Obedience unto death, right? Um, you know, we have Jesus' a struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, in contrast to Adam who fails in the Garden of Eden. Um, and then we have, you know, Paul's phrases like, having, you know, this is Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, uh, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found into human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. Right? So Jesus' faithfulness is the manifestation of the righteousness of God. So, if faith and belief are the same root, is it Jesus believing in God then? Yeah, so the question is, the word itself is multivalent. It could be faithful. So the, it works for both English and in Greek. Faithfulness or to believe or to have faith in. It works both ways. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's one, it's one of those weird words in which um, the Greek and English have fairly similar uh, semantic range. Yeah. So, Jesus' faithfulness means... He's faithful to his calling. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Questions? Yes? So, on your reading, <coughs> excuse me, the last, the last few words of, of that verse, for all who believe, mm -hmm. and take it on the Reformation reading, that's giving you like the, um, I don't know, the condition or like the, the instruments of the, of righteousness, sort of. I mean, it's what brings about the righteousness. Right. Are you saying it's just, um, this has been revealed, and of course the way you, you see it is that you believe, right? I mean, it's revealed in Jesus, and when you believe in Jesus, you see what's happened. Right? Are you asking about the Reformation reading or my reading? I'm asking reading? about yours now. Oh, so wait, so yeah, you have to tell you. So my reading says righteousness God is revealed in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And it's that 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 is given that this transformation is oriented to people who believe. Mm. If God's going to fix the world, the way He's doing is through faith in Jesus Christ. The in the recipients of this God's faithfulness is people who believe. Uh, does the through faith does that come up elsewhere in Greek and some other places? It's gonna keep showing up. Well, I'm not, not in the Romans, but like the oh. outside text, or what you know. You mean the faithfulness of Jesus issue? Or just like through faith in like Caesar. I don't know. Oh no, I I don't. That that phrase, he, phrasing, uh, I guess, grammatical phrasing. It's a. I won't. I'm not able. To, I'm not able to answer that question. I, yeah. So. Yeah. It's a good. It's an interesting question. Um, I have not seen any commentator reference. Pisteos, uh, uh, dia pisteos, as being some other kind of set phrase with certain kind of meaning. Okay. Right. So I have not seen that. In, in, you mean like in classical Greek or in yeah. other kinds of, in kind of setting, Yeah, I have not seen that being referenced that way. Yeah. Okay. So we kind of tackle that first part of it, and and now mm -hmm. we're going to tackle four words that are that are quite significant and important. Uh, for understanding this passage. Um, for there is no distinction. Now, obviously, the distinction between Jews and Gentiles. I mean, the context is, has to be that. There's nothing else, right? So there's no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as an expiation by His blood to be received by faith. Let's tackle glory of God first. What does it mean to fall short of the glory of God? Uh, the Greek is um, doxes to theu the glory of God, it translates the Old Testament phrase, kavod Adonai. Um, in the Old Testament, God's glory refers to a visible manifestation of his divine nature. So, Adam, a physical being in God's image, that is a glory of God. The Torah, a visible enactment of his values. Thunderstorms, other awesome natural phenomena, a radiance emanating from his presence, etc., etc. Those are all physical things you can see um, that are kavod Adonai. Now, in the New Testament, the phrase is less focused on what is visible, but the basic idea of the expression of God's divine nature remains. Um, is it Luke or Matthew? I think it was Luke, right? The, 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 glory of, the glory of the Lord 
Remember the glory of the Lord? Uh, in, in, at the time of Jesus' birth, the glory of the Lord appeared in the skies and to the, to the shepherds, right? That's the Kavod the night they're talking about. The glory of Yahweh showed up. That a very visible manifestation of God's power and essence shows up. Okay. Um, so in this passage, Adam as being the glory of God is clearly in view. We have this idea of, of falling short of the glory of God. Who falls short of the glory of God? Well, Adam did. This is a, a Greco-Roman text, a Greek text, Hellenistic text, the first century. Um, Jewish literature. Um, it's called the Life of Adam and Eve and Apocalypses of Moses. Now, you guys are like, what is all this stuff? <laughs> we have the Bible, we have the Torah, we have the Navi, and we have all this stuff, right? And then we have a bunch of Jewish writers who decide to write all kinds of expansion, call it fanfic if you want. <laughs> okay? They write expansion stories on the Bible. They take a verse or a story and they just kind of adding all kinds of details to it. I mean, today we have them, right? Um, I mean, I don't know if you go, if you look, I, I used to look through a CBD, Christian book distributor, that dialed, and you found like books like, what we call Samuel, and it's like a fictionalized version of biblical characters, right, or your Ruth, and they start, she starts, she start, it's her diary or something like that. They, they, they just add stuff, okay. We do that, they've been, they've been doing that for two, three thousand years, okay, this is just the impulse we have to fill in the blanks. And the way we fill in our blanks really what? really reveals who we are and reveals kind of our assumptions and our priorities, right? So it's very interesting when you read this. Well, here's one uh, from first century, and it's, it's retelling the story of Adam and Eve. And it's going to fill in certain theological um, uh, presuppositions that these authors bring to, the, to their fan fiction writing. Um, so I cried out that very hour, Adam, Adam, where are thou? Rise up, come to me, and I will show thee a great secret. But when your father came, this is God talking, obviously, I spoke to him words of transgression, which brought us down from our great glory. For when he came, I opened my mouth, and the devil was speaking. And I began to exhort him and said, Come hither, my Lord Adam, hearken to me, and eat of the fruit of the tree, um, which God, oh, sorry, it's not, not, not God talking, this is, um, what's her name talking? Eve. Which God told us not to eat of it, and thou shalt be as a God. And your father answered and said, I fear lest God be, be, be wroth with me. Sorry, the translation is old, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is very King James. Uh, God be wroth with me. And I said to him, fear not, for as soon as thou hast eaten, thou shalt know good and evil. And speedily I persuade him, and he ate, and straightway his eyes were open, and he too knew his nakedness. And to me he saith, O oh, wicked woman, what have I done to thee that thou hast deprived thee of the glory of God? Okay, so the story is expanded, the, 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 the ideology is, what's it being emphasized here? Eve's fault, big time, yeah. right? Eve's yeah. fault, big time, right? This is, this is, a, this is a patriarchal text. It's, it's somewhat misogynistic. Adam didn't want to really want to do it. He got forced into it, right? So we're really, really nailing, the, nailing Eve on this one. Um, but the, the, key, the reason I cited it is because of this last line, right? Where... Adam never says this in the text, but the author says, you know what? We're very well aware that Adam was meant to be the glory of God. And now he has been deprived of it by eating this fruit. Okay. So, any questions on this? It's very interesting how they write stuff like this. You know, I mean, if you get a chance to write about you know, Genesis 1 and rewrite it, how would you do it? Go ahead. Um, you just said it, the glory of God was, the glory of God was like, the physical manifestation? Yeah, visible manifestation of God. Like, the fact that it's Hellenistic, like mm -hmm. the Greek thought, mm -hmm. like interacting with the Jewish thought, affect right. the right. glory of God's thought. Or are we getting so it's an interesting question. You're, you're, you're asking a great question, which is how much, how Greek is this? Right. It is written in Greek. Um, I would say it is very much interacting with Jewish um, stories, obviously. Um, so I would say this is still very, very Jewish. Um, but you can tell clearly that Adam as a glory of God is um, prom it's clear and it's, that's kind of out there now. That's a, that's a kind of an understandable phrase. So when, when Paul refers to fall short of the glory of God, everybody says, yeah, okay, we're talking about Adam. We get that we have a high human, we, we, we back to the high anthropology, high human calling, um, which I don't think is very Greek. At least, if you think, if you think about Gnostic, if you kind of think of any kind of Gnostic or a philosophy in which humans are trapped on Earth in an earthly existence and need to escape from it, and that's very much a, a more of a Greek, traditionally, kind of stereotypically Greek idea. This isn't it. 
this more speaks of him being the glory of God, and then there's a fall in his eating of, of the fruit. So, any questions on this? Okay. Um, not just in that text, also in the Qumran text. Um, this is the community rule in, in, in 1QS, first, around 100 CE. Um, this is not a biblical text. The Qumran had, a, had created these rules for their community to operate. And, um, and this is kind of like, an, it's pretty much, if today you would call it a cult. Right? They, they went out to live in the desert. And they're like had these all these you know inner group purity rituals, and they sit there and they're waiting for God to show up. Okay, the the we, we the only thing missing is kind of like you know Kool Aid, but mm -hmm. but we don't know you know we don't know what happened to these people actually. Now, some people argue they all became Christians, which is a different different thought entirely. Um, God will then purify every deed of man with His truth. He will refine for Himself the human frame by rooting out all spirit of injustice from the bounds of His flesh. So he's talking about transformation here. He will cleanse him of all wicked deeds with the spirit of holiness. Like purifying waters, he will shed upon him the spirit of truth to cleanse him of all abomination and injustice. And he shall be plunged into the spirit of purification that he, sorry, may instruct the upright in the knowledge of the Most High and teach the wisdom of the sons of heaven to the perfect of way. For God has chosen them for an everlasting covenant and all the glory of Adam shall be there. There shall be no more lies, and all the works of injustice shall be put to shame. Uh, definitely an understanding that the Adam was the exalted person, and that there's going to be a recovery of that exalted status. Okay. So, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're, we're, we're looking at we're looking at the, the, the biblical story of Adam. Um, justified is the next word, um, and this is, we get back to the question you had earlier, James. Um, what we mean by justified in this passage. Um, last time we talked about our understanding of the criminal justice system. And we tend to think of God as the judge and God as the prosecutor. And we individual sinners are kind of uh, the accused. right? And then and when we are declared um, in, uh, uh, innocent or guilty, but that's not how the court system worked in the, in, the, in the first century. The court system worked this way. You have a judge and you have litigants, one suing the other. And to be justified means to be on the victorious end. You won the, suit, you won the trial against the other group. And in the Bible, the major courtroom case that's on, that's, that's, that's on offer, the major metaphor, is really God's people and people who are not God's people. All right? People who are wrong about God and people who are with God. So we have God's people, Gentiles. In the, in the, in, from the Jewish perspective, the Jewish perspective, they believe that there will be a future law, a court case. There will be a future vindication. Okay? When I say vindication, I mean justification. Okay? Because the word justify can't really mean to win, to win the court trial. Since right now, the, let's put it this way. It's, it is clear right now that there's, that it, it is, okay, it is it's, sorry, I'm, I'm saying the wrong, wrong way. It is not clear right now that Christians are vindicated in this world. Would you agree? Right. Nobody, nobody's saying, oh yeah, Christians got it right. Nobody's saying that, right? So whatever vindication or whatever justification you're talking about has to be a future one. It has to be an eschatological end of time vindication. There will be a time when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're looking and waiting for that day. Okay? So justification, the real one, is always a future event. The, tr the true one, in which everybody says, oh yeah, you guys, you guys are right about Jesus. You guys are right about God. Okay? And you guys are right about how the world should be. And what is morality, what is good and evil. Okay? So there's going to be a vindication that day. The question that people are coming up with is, how do you know, you as, as an individual living right now, that you are actually part of the vindicated group? Given that we believe there is going to be a vindicated group, how do you know you belong in it? Okay. That's the question. How will you know you'll be vindicated in the future? So what Paul, well, what the Jews would argue is, well, in the present day, those who practice the works of the Torah 
will be part of the, the, the people who are vindicated in the future. You have the covenant, you have the Torah, you do circumcision, you do food law, you do Sabbath. You are that chosen people. You will be in. That's what the Jews have been proclaiming. Okay. And Paul says, no, it doesn't work. The Torah cannot do that for you. It cannot get you in because it hasn't transformed your life. You live exactly the same way as everybody else. Paul says, really, it's those who believe in Jesus as God's Messiah. Those people, by the grace of God, are part of this new Israel. Okay. That's the justification he's talking about. So the word justification, those who are justified, is first of all, it's future, but it's also present. There's an anticipation of the future justification. Who gets into that future group that will be vindicated? Okay. Now, the question here is, and of course, when we look at this, you think, yeah, but... Why do these people get to get in? What is it about having faith in Jesus as God's Messiah that somehow is superior okay, than this one? I think people can ask that. I think you can easily ask that question because they sound kind of the same. One waves the Torah. So yeah, we have the Torah. One says we have the cross of Jesus. Right? What's the difference? And that's a really interesting question, which Paul, I think, doesn't really get to answer until chapter 5, next time we meet. Okay? But I'm, I'm just telling you right now that the, the, the problem with the way we read Romans is we typically divide, the, you know, chapter 3, 4 is justification. Chapter 5, 6 is sanctification. They divide it into those neat chunks. And I'm saying, oh, no, 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 no. You see the problem here already, right? Implicit in this comparison. Paul's saying, this is superior to that. This will actually justify you. Implicit with that argument is, this will transform you. Okay. The grace of God, those who faith have Jesus Christ, that has the ability to actually change your lives so that you will be worthy of the vindication given to you. If not, then how is this different from that? How is this different from that? And this is all going to show up in 5, 6, 7, and 8. It's the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is breaking out of the power of sin. It's, it's the deep-rooted, complete transformation of new life that we call sanctification that is actually built into this, to justification. In, th in this way of reading Paul, justification and sanctification are not two separate things. But it is indeed one thing. And that's critical. Because when you teach us separate things, what you happens is you open the possibility, and many have walked through it, which is, I now believe I am a justified Christian. I don't want to be sanctified. Okay? And you have people who think that way. You have Christians, despite teachers trying to say, no, no, they're both really important. You need to do both. But if you teach it separately, it's just too easy to walk through that. I have faith in Christ. I'm saved. I'm justified. I'm, I have membership in the new Israel. Sanctification sounds like a, what's the word? A super, you know, super Christian status, right? You have the regular Christian and you have the super Christian status, right? And indeed, um, Barna, had this, this survey of, of, of Christianity in America shows this precise breakdown. It shows how most Christians have exactly the same belief and behavior in their giving pattern, in their, in their uh, 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 divorce pattern, in, their, in their adultery, in, in, in crimes, as the rest of America. And that there's a very small subset that actually live out the gospel and the claims of the gospel. We created this by our theology. And by the way, we teach the Bible. We created this dual-track Christianity, which I don't think exists in the Bible. To be justified, if this is superior to that because the gospel of Jesus can transform us. And that's what qualifies us to be vindicated. And it's by the grace of God. I'm not saying this is by works. It is by the grace of God. God is committed to doing this. The faithfulness of God is committed to transforming us. I'm jumping way ahead to next, next time we talk. But I just think it's important to put the point out right here in, in our understanding of justification. Charles, is there... Yes. Um, there's, in my mind, a significant difference between mm -hmm. to believe 
belief in something yes. and belief that something. So okay. belief that something feels like mm -hmm. intellectual assent sure. of, of something. So that would turn that, that bottom line there. Uh, those who believe that Jesus is God's Messiah. Yeah. Um, and that seems like something you just intellectually assent to, whereas believe in always seems like awkward phrasing to me. Mm -hmm. But but the only way the only way you can like define believing in something mm -hmm. is by action. I, I, yeah, exactly. I think I think I think I think you're putting your finger right on what I'm getting at, which is I, mean, I would say this way. I would put it like those who pledge their allegiance to Jesus as God's final king, world king, so something I, like yeah, that. So what I want to know is yeah. if I am trying to give that explanation to yeah. somebody, does that tiny distinction yeah. is that supported in in the text? Like, yeah. is, I, is I would say I would say text? absolutely. Uh, absolutely, the, the, the idea of uh, intellectual assent, Paul nowhere argues that, but doesn't believe that. Okay, Paul, Paul, does, Paul doesn't believe intellectual assent, and, and James points it out, because you know, James is like, yeah, you, but Paul's like, I never meant that anyway. Right? I never meant faith as, 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 as kind of an intellectual assent to some, some, some philosoph you know, philosophical proposition. It's true. Jesus is God's Messiah. Yes, it is true. No. It is a commitment to <laughs> Uh, Jesus, to live out Jesus as as king, as a the, the authority figure for the for, for, of, of all time. Now, here's the thing: those who commit to doing that, then you have people who commit to the Torah as the authority. The two differences: that one has the ability by grace to transform you; the other one, the other one, one does not; the other one does, because one has a source to destroy power, to destroy sin and death, and to confuse us with the Holy Spirit. The other one just points out the sin. So it doesn't matter how much you believe in it, how much you want to live by it, you can't. And that's really the struggle of Romans 7. So we're, we're, we're really going forward here. Yes? Maybe uh, Paul will get to it in the next chapters, but how does he have the gumption to just throw out the Torah like that? Great question, and he, and he would say, I am not throwing out the Torah at all. Right. <laughs> That's chapter well, four. Kind of. Yeah, just, just, just you wait. It's a great, I'm so glad you asked that, <laughs> because it is exactly where, it, that's exactly the worries that people have. Because he just said, the Torah doesn't justify you. And the Jewish, Jewish Christians are going, whoa. And the, and the, you know, the Gentile Christians are like, yeah, we're, but we're reading this stuff. <laughs> okay, what, what, what do you mean? All right, so what exactly do you do with the Torah? So, great question. Okay, and that's exactly the, the, the problem that Paul has to confront, and he confronts in chapter 4. Okay. But let me uh, get us forward, because we're, we're, we're going to run out of time soon. Um, you know, redemption, I, I'm going to be very quick about it. So I'm going to say, glory of God, they are justified. They are, when we say justified, we're obviously talking about a anticipatory justification. They have membership in the group that will be vindicated in the future. Okay. By his grace as a gift, through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth to the peaks. Okay. Um, redemption, I just want to get clear. Um, it, um, a polytroseos, it's a slave market metaphor to free someone from slavery via paying a ransom. Old Testament usage, the archetypal understanding of redemption among Israelites is the exodus from Egypt. God's people are freed from slavery, oppression, and genocide. That's kind of Old Testament understanding of redemption. Um, and I want to put down the redemption metaphor does not work in this case. Okay, if you see these two metaphors, they don't work. God doesn't actually pay a ransom to Egypt. You notice? He didn't buy them. He kind of kicked their butts. <laughs> so he, he, you can say he, he, he paid them back, all right. <laughs> you know, you want to do it that way if you like, but it's not really working. So I would say this word, when Paul talks about redemption, he's not necessarily talking about a price that's being paid. That's not being the focus. The Old Testament understanding of redemption, the focus is on the freedom from slavery aspect freedom from oppression aspect rather than payment. Okay? People who try to push the idea of payment too far cause get, gets into all kinds of trouble in, in, in theology. Okay. We talked about that before. We did. We, we did that in the, in the discussion of the, the meaning of Jesus, cross, of Jesus ah, Christ yes. on the cross. So it, it was a Lutron word. Lutron was the actual word payment, ransom. And we're saying that has a similar problem. Anybody who tried to push that too far ended up with God paying Jesus to, to the devil, which just gets weird. Okay, it was actually a very popular theology back in the second, third century. Okay, and then finally, we're going to get to a word that's just, oh boy, uh, the, a word that has caused so much trouble. Um, 
through the redemption of Christ Jesus, who God put forward as an expiation by His blood. Um, you can put out the hysteria. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> the word RSV translates expiation, NASB King James translates propitiation. First of all, there's a major problem. People arguing back and forth between these two words. And now you're like, what's the difference? Propitiation is something given to appease an angry God. So God is mad at you want to propitiate his anger. Expiation means it's cleansing, it's like bleach. So something is dirty, you cleanse it off. So one is directed at the deity, one is more directed at the, kind of the, the noxious effect of sin and the contamination, and you can decontaminate it. Okay. Our NRC, NIV, TNIV translates sacrifice of, sacrifice of atonement, which is really taking an easy way out, because nobody really knows what atonement means anyway. <laughs> Seriously, what does atonement mean? Well, it depends on who you ask. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a bailout, okay? Now here's the word, here's the thing. NIV 2011 footnote. The Greek for sacrifice of atonement refers to the atonement cover of the Ark of the Covenant. You're sitting there going, what? All these biblical translations, expiation, propitiation, sacrifice of atonement, the NIV 2011 footnote says, well, let's just kind of cut to the chase. The Greek word actually itself means the cover of the covenant. I mean, sorry, of, of, the, of the ark. This is the ark, this cover right here, with two cherubim's wings stretched out. That's not the actual one, okay? So tomorrow. <laughs> the real one's in a U.S. Army base somewhere. We all know where that is. <laughs> we all know where that is. But, but this is the fake one, and, and this cover right here is called the hilasterium in the Septuagint. Let me, let me in fact just give you the data on that. So I just, because this is significant enough that I'm not gonna, I don't wanna like, you know, I wanna give you the data. Paul uses exactly once. Here it is, 325. So we're just gonna skip that one. The rest of the New Testament, Hebrew 9.5 uses a once, using it referred to the Ark cover. Septuagint, 28 times. 13 times Exodus, Ark cover. How to make it and the making of. Leviticus, uh, uh, seven, seven times, our cover, how to do a day of atonement, and Numbers, one time, our cover, description of God instructing Moses. It's all there. If, you, if, you're, if you're reading out of the Septuagint, Hilasterium means ark cover. Now, if you go to the Greek side, you will find references to the place of sacrifice being done. Okay, it's the location of sacrifice. Um, and if you go to the Maccabees, you will have two Jewish martyrs being compared to a hilasterium as a metaphor. <coughs> so, you know, given all these options here, I'm just going to go with a footnote. Because <laughs> they're, they're trying to, they're trying to, they're tr they're, they're, I, I would go with a literal because that's actually, actually when, I, when I think Paul's writing to the Romans, uh, to the Romans that they're sitting there going, oh, he's talking about Jesus as the Ark cover. Whatever you get out of that, we can go from there. But let's start with the first metaphor, find the foundational metaphor, before we get to, does that mean expiation, propitiation, or atonement? Let's go from, let's go from the original metaphor first. Okay? So the original metaphor, Jesus is the new Ark cover. And if you look at the text, sorry, let me get back here. If you look at the text, a God put forward as a Ark cover by his blood, Jesus' blood, obviously. So if you look at the, this, um, the, the uh, uh, Leviticus 16 text, you will see that the, the high priest will scatter blood onto the Ark cover in the Day of Atonement as a way of cleansing it and re recreating it as the place where God and humans meet. Okay, so by Jesus' blood. Um, so let me, um, let me take a look at what, what Hilasterium means in the Old Testament. Um, uh, Exodus 25, uh, there I will meet with you from above, the mercy seat, or ark cover, hilasterium. Mercy seat is a Lutheran language. Luther called it the mercy seat. I don't know why, but he did. Okay. Uh, from between the two cherub, cherubim that are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you of all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. So it is the place where God meets Moses. In fact, this mercy seat is the kind of the conceptually the throne of God. God sits there. Okay. The, the, lo the central location point of God in the entire temple complex is the cover, right? But the space right between those two wings, the two wing, the two winged cherub, cherubs, right there. 
Um, number 789, when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with Yahweh, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was upon the Ark of the Testimony and from, be from between the two cherubim and it spoke to him. Okay. Um, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the Ark, lest he die, for I appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. You have the Ark, you have this cherub, and there's kind of a haze, a cloud around it, a manifestation of God's essence, which we probably call the glory of God if you want it, want to call it that, and right there. Okay. Very physically located. Okay. So, a few things to think about if we're talking about Jesus as the Hillisterium. <clears throat> Hillisterium is God's throne from which he rules Israel. It is his presence that defines Israel as the people of God. For Jesus to be the new Hillisterium signify God's renewed presence among his people. This is critical. The old ark is gone. Okay? Everybody knows this. That the second temple was operated, when, when, the, when the people returned from the exile and they rebuilt the temple, um, and it got really big during the time of Jesus, and, and even at this point, uh, hasn't been destroyed yet, the Holy of Holies is empty. There is no ark. Okay? It was lost during the Babylonian exile. Okay? So, you have, so think about it, you have, you, have a, you have an entire temple complex that's doing all this stuff, but the thing that, that at the very center, the thing that represents God's presence is actually empty. It's gone. The whole thing's a shell with no reality inside. Okay? That's a story that's being told of the temple here. And then God comes along, apart from the temple complex, and says, I'm going to put forth a person named Jesus as the Hillisterium. So, the Hillisterium covers the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, which represent the covenant between Israel and God. Jesus, this represents a renewed covenant with a living, I mean, so with a living covenant. It's a human being, well, God, yes, but human being is now the Ark cover. And since the Hillisterium is the center of the temple, where a sacrificial system removed the sins of the people, Jesus serves as the new temple. So we're talking about the Hillisterium really representing this entire new way of approaching God. Okay, a new way of, of, of forgiveness of sin, a new way of, of, of re reconciling God with humanity. Happening all right here with a, with a hill of stereo. Do you connecting this somehow to the tearing of the veil between... You mean in, in Mark? Yeah, yeah, I mean, with, yeah. with the death of, of Jesus, you get... You get right, it's all, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of, that's a great question. I, if I, God's I, not, I mean, if... If, That's there not the, if there's theological significance to God not being there, yeah. then why would there also be theological significance to the veil? That's because I, I have a different interpretation of the tearing of the veil. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, would, so yeah. Can it be summarized? It can be very brief. It can be very brief. Okay. Be very brief. Um, in the, I'm going to go with Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, the first one there, I, I, okay. Gospel of Mark um, has in, in the ending, if you if start with chapter 11, Jesus enters into the temple. It's one massive, basically, it's two temples fighting against each other. You have the old temple complex in which Jesus says it's going to be cursed, like the tree, and tossed into the, into the lake if you, if you wanted to. You don't need it anymore. You can pray, you can pray without um, at the temple. You can get forgiveness without the temple. You can do everything without the temple. And then after that, it's just conflict, conflict between him and the, and the temple leaders. In chapter 11, chapter 12. And, and basically, he's showing the bankruptcy of the entire, entire system. And in chapter 13, what is chapter 13? The temple will be destroyed. Right. That's, that 11, 12, 13 is corruption of the temple and the destruction of the temple. And then what happens in the ending, 15, is Jesus, the new temple, dies. And in that crying out, the curtain splits open. Now, I don't, so people say, oh, we can now enter in with God. My interpretation is that there's really nothing in there about separate, there's nothing in the Gospel of Mark that's really focused on the separation of God and man. What it's focused on is the, is the bankruptcy of the temple. It's now pulled open so you can see there's nothing in it. In fact, this is kind of a symbolic destruction of the old temple. So I think it's a different interpretation. But I think it suits the context of the Gospel of Mark better than, than the other approach. The other approach, I think, imports a lot of Pauline ideas into the Gospels. 
and 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 Mark doesn't really focus on that issue of how you know humans and God being separated and require and requires this way of getting in. In fact, the dominant metaphor in, in, in the Gospels for Jesus' death is covenant renewal, not sin sacrifice. Okay. Mark, Matthew, Luke, so not the Gospels, the focus is on Jesus as new covenant. Okay. Yes? Yes, it's a hell of the iron by his blood. So yes. I guess is it like he also sees the ark over and the blood? It's his, he sheds his blood, and by the pouring of his blood, remember, our covers is bathed in blood. Yeah. If you read Leviticus 16, every year they go and they just dump tons of blood on the hill of Okay. okay it's, and it's dried up, they don't clean it up. It's big, oh my God, it's a bloody mess in there. Okay? <laughs> and so you think about a gold cover that's covered with blood. Okay? So, yeah, it's instituted. It's, it's, it's made into a hill of by the sacrifice of blood. So Jesus here, now we have a, we have a new understanding of Jesus' of death on the cross, <laughs> which is Jesus' death on the cross also signify a Hillestorian instituting sacrifice. Or, you, you see what I'm saying? He actually becomes a Hillestorian by his death on the cross. Okay. So, let's, let's kind of clarify this a bit. Um, Justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, freedom from sin, uh, re, re, freedom, uh, that puts forth as a as a hilasterion by his blood of sacrifice, this is really problematic. They, they, they constantly throw in um, um, phrases like receive by faith or faith in Jesus when the Greek doesn't really say that. Okay? The Greek here says diapisteos, because of faith or because of faithfulness. Okay, which is, could simply be, it's a, it's a hilasterion by his blood out of his faithfulness. Jesus' faithfulness to the cross. Right? The, the English translation is, is always taking, whenever they see faith, they're saying, oh, it's our faith. They're constantly doing that. And it's like, well, no, it's focused on Jesus. His faithfulness, by his blood, he becomes a hilasterian. And that shows his righteousness, which I'm, I'm getting back to you, how important understanding God's righteousness is. If you understand in one way, you, re, re, you interpret all these phrases and all these Greek little phrases as one thing. If you read it as God's commitment to fix the world, if God is committed in his faithfulness, then he sends his son, he sends his son Jesus, he's also committed. And he is faithful. Okay? And our, our, our transformation, our participation in God's kingdom is based on Jesus' faithfulness um, to be the hilasterian. The next two passages are a little weird, but I think we can figure this out. This was to show God's righteousness, show God's commitment to fixing the world, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. That's one line. And it's the other line. It was to prove that at the present time, he himself is righteous, and that he justifies him who has faith in Jesus. Okay. Um, a couple things. God putting Jesus as the new hilasterion, is the, is the manifestation of his righteousness. Okay. And what by doing that, it accomplishes two things. One, it shows that God's righteousness is still active, even though he passed over former sins. And the other second thing is, this new act has the ability to vindicate those who have faith in him. Actually, the phrase here is actually, ek pisteos yesu, those who are out of the faithfulness of Jesus. It's really a much better interpretation. Those people whose lives, whose lives are defined by the faithfulness of Jesus. Um, this, this is a problematic verse, and let me, let me see if I can clarify this. Um, before Jesus, God had been passing over former sins. Okay. What does that mean? Um, I think the best way to understand this is once we've understood Jesus as a Hillasterion, which it gets everybody thinking, oh right, we don't have one. Then it occurs to everybody that the entire temple complex is empty. That there's been no temple complex. There's, no resol there's been no fixing and cleansing of sins. All that sacrifice that people have been offering in the temple, that did nothing. Absolute squat because there is no hilasterion. There's no God there. 
okay? So God's been, in a way, like, you know what? I know there's no temple, and you guys are doing this stuff, and we're just going to pass over. We're gonna just going to sweep that under because we, I haven't instituted a temple all this time. Okay, I have not put it in system in place. So in my forbearance, I'm going to pass over it. And that shows my continued commitment to this world. I did not just like all the sin piled up, squash everybody. But instead, you know what? I didn't provide a temple. I'm going to provide one now. Okay, I'm going to provide a new temple in Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. And second, that God is righteous. Um, that God is going to restore everything by vindicating those who have who are out of the faithfulness of Jesus. So not only is this a new temple, but there's this is this is proleptic. This is looking forward. Okay. Okay. It says at the present time. I, I know. I know that, that what I'm saying is the, the the justifying people who have faith in who are who are out of the faithfulness of Jesus is a phrase that he's going to explain later. That's what I mean by that. There's a group of people who are going to be whose lives are going to be defined by the faithfulness of Jesus. And this is really important. The Greek here is more, this translation is not good at all. Uh, it's ex pisteos Jesu. Okay. Ek, exit, out of. Faithfulness, Jesus. There's a group of people who are defined by this. They, they, they spring forth out of the faithfulness of Jesus. Okay. They're kind of defined by it. Um, and he's going to vindicate those people. Questions? Charles? Yes. Do we have any way of knowing if the absence of the ark was kind of a well known? Yeah, well, what's his name showed up? Uh, was it Titus? Or was it Hadrian? Shoot, I forget. At 50 BC, the Romans marched in. Okay, the Roman, emperor, the Roman general marched into Jerusalem. This is before Jesus. He goes in there to do a direct showdown because he just defeated the Jewish army. Remember, uh, uh, well, from 160 to 160 or so to 1250, the Jews actually achieve independence. The Maccabean revolt, they actually get the Hasmonean Empire, dynasty, not empire. Um, they actually created an independent kingdom. And that kingdom was then defeated by the Romans. So the Roman the defeated the army, walks in, he says, you know what, I'm going to go challenge the deity because all battle in the ancient world is religious warfare. So Roman God obviously beat, kicked the heck out of Yahweh. So I'm going to go into the temple of Yahweh, and usually what they do, this is an interesting point, Babylonians and the Assyrians used to do, is they would take the, the idol from the defeated kingdom's temple and move it to our temple and say, we took your, king, your idol, see, we won. He goes in there, and there's nothing in there. He actually says this. It's like, there's nothing in there. And from there on, the, the rumor came out that Jews are, are, are atheists. Because there's no God in there. <laughs> it's empty. The Jews were, were known as atheists, and, and so did cri early Christians too, because they didn't believe worship idols. So gods are so integrally tied to a physical shape that the idea you can worship an invisible God is kind of crazy for them, okay, for the, for the Roman world. So yeah, it was w widely recognized that there's nobody in there. In fact, the Jews were in shock. He walked in the Holy Holies and didn't die. Like, what the heck? How did that happen? Our, with the book we read, Right? People go in there, die. The guy who touched it by accident gets killed, right? Whoa, this is a serious, you know, serious issue. Our holy holy doesn't do jack. And that was kind of a blow, well, I think, to the Jewish faith. Maybe some Jews became atheists because of that. <laughs> Possibly. I have no idea. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things happening in, in, the, in, the, in, that, in that time. But yeah, it's, it's, it is widely known that there is no Ark of the Covenant inside the, inside the temple. Yeah. Which is... I mean, they, they just kept doing it. I mean, they went ahead with the temple system. Mm -hmm. And when, when Jesus comes along, he's just like, I mean, you can say he's, people say he's cleansing the temple. I don't think he is. He's saying, I'm pronouncing doom on this temple. This, this temple does nothing. So, other questions? Okay, so let's take a five minute break, stretch break, and we'll get to chapter four.